Welcome to the uh, Selling MDM to Leadership, uh, first in the uh, series of our uh, live panel uh, um, conversations. So um, let's just get started. I can see there's still people uh, joining, but um, we are a minute or two over the start time. So let's, uh, let's jump in and get started. So like I said, this is the first uh, of a series. So let's, let me just introduce you to the series. Then I'll introduce you to today's topic and the, uh, the speakers that we have. So today's topic is around uh, organizational readiness. Um, what are the, some of the prerequisites you need before you can really get started? How do you know you're ready to get started with master data management? Um, then uh, tomorrow we'll be tackling uh, the why. How do you get through a justification selling this, um, you know, literally the piece where you're selling to leadership. Uh, then the uh, total cost of ownership calculation. So the, uh, obviously an important part of um, uh, our return on investment justification is knowing the total cost of ownership. Uh, that will be on Thursday of this week. And then the uh, next week, uh, we'll talk about the program scope, how to uh, pick the right place to start uh, with your uh, um, MDM journey and uh, also where, uh, you know, what your second and third phase uh, goals may be. Um, evaluation pitfalls when you're looking at uh, um, selecting uh, a tool set, what to look for, what not to look for, what's going to meet your needs. And then beyond the first use case, because um, we have found that the people who get maximum value out of master data management are the ones that go well beyond the first use case, um, even beyond the second and third use case. And uh, master data management kind of becomes a way of life, uh, looking at um, you know expanding the use of MDM into many different parts of the, the business. So the format that we're going to have for these uh, um, uh, webcasts is going to be um, really a roundtable conversation. I'm going to moderate. My name is Martin Boyd, VP Product Marketing at uh, uh, Prophecy, down at uh, listed at the bottom on this slide. Um, I'll introduce myself really briefly. Then I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers, and then we will get into the, the meat of the conversation. So um, I've got uh, um, a number of years' experience in master data management, data governance, and data quality. Um, starting with uh, Silver Creek Systems, who was a specialist in um, product data quality. Um, we were then acquired into Oracle, and I spent some time uh, working with uh, master data management and data quality uh, as part of Oracle, uh, then left Oracle, went to another um, um, MDM company, and then uh, for the last year or so, I've been here in, uh, in Prophecy. And uh, master data management and governance is something that I'm uh, fairly passionate about. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, wins, a lot of people who've, who've done a lot of uh, really good stuff in MDM, and I've seen a fair share of people who didn't get it right. So I'm really keen to hear what our panelists have to say about how to get this right, and hopefully that will be good learning for uh, for all of you on the call. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask these folks to introduce themselves. First of all, uh, Bill O'Kane, former Gartner analyst. Um, Bill, could you introduce yourself? Sure, Martin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill O'Kane. I've been with Prophecy about a year. Uh, prior to that, I ran uh, Gartner's MDM practice for about eight years, uh, starting in 2011. Uh, I was the lead author on the MDM for Customer Data Magic Quadrant for four years and then created and led uh, the larger MDM um, single Magic Quadrant for four years. Uh, in that time, I interacted with about 3,000 clients uh, and vendors. Prior to that, I was a practitioner going all the way back to 2001 uh, and have taken part in six or seven uh, governance and MDM implementations in that time between 2001 and 11. So with the number of uh, consultations you had at Gartner, would you say it's a decent guess that you've had the most conversations about master data management of anyone alive on the planet? I would say that, and I, I may also have uh, the broadest implementation experience. And I've also, as we're, we'll talk about today, made some of the biggest mistakes uh, and managed to dive and catch them before they were catastrophes. Excellent. All right. Well, we're looking forward to hearing uh, more from you and your perspective. Um, Christopher, uh, Christopher Dwight is our VP of Customer Success at Prophecy. He's been in the space for a long time and has also seen his fair share, I think, of, of successes and uh, not successes. Christopher, can you uh, say a word or two? Absolutely. So uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, as Martin said, I, I lead our customer success organization. Uh, I've been here at Prophecy just over three years. Um, 
Prior to that, I was at Informatica for a long time. I was there for four years. When I left, I was leading the MDM business in North America. Part of that, I was at Oracle for uh, six years. Um, it's actually where Martin and I first uh, met each other. We go back a ways. Um, and prior to that, I was one of the founding members of a startup that created MDM technology or early MDM technology before it's even called that. Um, so over the years, I've engaged with a lot of different uh, organizations. And as Martin said, seen some things done right, uh, seen some things, uh, some lessons learned, and we're hoping to share some of those with everybody today. And would you want to just, just mention a word or two about your current role of, uh, of VP Customer Success at Prophecy and what, what that means? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, you'll hear about this throughout this whole series. Data management is not a project. It's not once and done. It's a program. Um, and for that reason, having a team to support our clients on their data management journey is really important because, as you can see, even in the titles of the, uh, the session we're going to be covering, we're trying to help organizations realize value quickly, have success quickly, but then continue on the journey. And that takes ongoing support and guidance. So myself and my team are there to, to help our customers realize those quick wins, but to not stop there to continue on their journey and continue to grow their data management program within the organization successfully. Excellent. Thanks, Christopher. Um, next up is uh, Harbert Bernard, um, Value Management Consultant at Prophecy. He owns the uh, BIR, uh, or Business Impact Roadmap uh, Program at uh, Prophecy. Um, Harbert, can you introduce yourself and maybe talk just a little bit about the BIR program? Yes, um, I lead the uh, global uh, value consulting practice for Prophecy. Uh, we've built business cases around uh, MDM investments and we've seen our clients achieve fabulous returns from implementing robust uh, MDM platforms and we look forward to discussing that with you today. Excellent. All right, well hopefully uh, you can all see that we have a pretty uh, um, experienced uh, panel here to talk about uh, the topic. Before we dive in, I'm going to say that um, we're, we're going to try and aim to uh, uh, finish the conversation part of this uh, meeting in, well, well before the end of the hour. So we should have time to answer any questions um, that you guys are, are interested in, in having answered. So um, if you can, uh, as we go along, uh, enter any questions into the uh, uh, question box in GoToMeeting, then I'll try and monitor that and try and uh, uh, we bring those questions to the attention of the panel, either as we go through or are wrapping up at the end. One other thing that we're interested in getting feedback from you uh, on is, um, and I think there will be a survey question when you log off, but as we go through, if there's something that you think would be interesting for us to cover as a future topic within this series or something that we can kind of add to the series, because it is, uh, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a plan here, but it's somewhat fluid. So if there's something in particular that you want to hear a bit, little bit more about, um, please feel free to enter it in and we will do our best to cover it today or, or, uh, or in the future. Um, obviously, this um, webcast is being recorded, as will all the others. Uh, so if you're registered for this, I mentioned you'll get a reminder uh, to let you, or, or not a reminder, but a, um, after we're done, you'll get a, a link to the recording so that you can come back and refer to them uh, at any point in the future if you're not able to be on um, all the sessions. Okay. Um, let's uh, dive in. Um, we're here today to talk about organizational readiness. Are you really ready as an organization to tackle master data management? What would be the prerequisites? What would be the uh, indicators that you're not ready in terms of organizational support or technology readiness or, uh, or anything else? And what would be the indicators that you are ready? Um, I know that Bill has uh, a lot of passion around this because, uh, as, as we said, he's done a lot of consultations from a lot of companies on, uh, on this whole topic. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot to say. Uh, the, the, the trick here is going to be trying to get uh, Bill not to use the whole hour uh, and give <laughs> the whole experience. We'll, we'll try and spread it out just a little bit between the different uh, sessions. But in terms of what does Ready look like, Bill, can you lead off and talk a little bit about uh, um, you know, what, what is why do you think it's important? I know that's one of your kind of key questions uh, or litmus tests when uh, uh, when talking to someone about this. Right. So so again, as I said in my introduction, uh, I was one of the worst offenders at this, so I have a right to say anything I want uh, in terms of bad behavior. Uh, I guess that's a rule. If you admit to doing it yourself, it's okay. Uh, but 
the major problem I saw in the eight years, and it took me a while to distill this, uh, and I still do see some of it today uh, with, with clients and prospects of, of us and our competitors, is these things, these discussions, these, these justifications, these positionings start from the wrong place from the get-go, uh, as I used to say. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, they start from the point of view of justifying data improvement or some sort of improvement in the way data is managed for it, for its own sake. And that's kind of a shortcut. Uh, and it's not always obvious. Uh, so uh, one of the things I used to do and still do is, is to say, you know, if you're having trouble, uh, and by the way, 80% of my activity while I was at Gartner concerned some form of this, at least in the beginning with, with a client. Uh, if you're having trouble, you know, what what's your business reason for wanting to do this? You know, what are your stakeholders expecting? What do you think? What do they think they're going to get when you deliver the first cut of this? Uh, and those of you that have been to Gartner events know that I, I have my four usual suspects. And this is in, in increasing order uh, of frequency. You know, the, the four suspects are when I say, what's your business case? Or what's your business justification, your overall story? How, do, how does it start? Uh, you get an answer like better data quality, better decisions. Uh, and those are obvious. You know, I get people that say, well, gee, I would never do that. You know, that that sounds crazy. But the next two aren't so crazy and they're very much more frequent. Uh, single version of the truth and finally the leader of the hip parade, 360 view of the customer. Uh, and usually when I would say that, everybody would hang their heads and look guilty because that's the one they used. Uh, that's my business reason for doing this. I need a 360 view of the customer. When the business reason is actually what they would do with that 360 view if they had it. And there were a bunch of techniques I would use around that. So again, uh, another I'll, I'll go through another couple of quick scenarios. Uh, one that I came up with last year talking to a CIO forum out in Arizona was, you know, if, if myself as an IT architect or you guys as CIOs uh, came to the conclusion after looking at the landscape that you needed to do an enterprise services bus because you're spending too much on maintenance or too many point integrations, there's too, too, causing too many operational problems, uh, having trouble retaining staff to keep that up, uh, you you would not communicate that decision to the business that way. You would not try to tell them what an ESB is or why it's good. Uh, but people do that with data all the time. IT people do that with data because they believe by default that the business understands that. And they may even unfortunately convince the business that they understand that. And that all works great until nine months later when, uh, and I'll come back to this in a second, when everybody wants to know what's been going on and the answer just involves data. And all of a sudden it's, you know, I don't know if I, you know, this, this is really much harder than I thought it would be. I thought you'd be done by now. Uh, so it's not always obvious. You know, the easy answers are better. You know, I have bad data. I need to fix it. That's not a business case. I want to make better decisions. That's not specific enough. It's not a business case. But when you get into the more insidious ones, like single version of the truth or 360 view of something, usually customer, uh, it's not so easy to tell that you're you're going down a wrong road. I would just point out, and and we're going to do examples tomorrow. So uh, if anybody doesn't hear a lot of specific examples today, don't panic. That's why we spread this out. We want to give each topic its due. So we will go into some very specific things tomorrow. But you know, the, the negative ones, the the most insidious negative one is that 360 view. And usually, if you dig into it even a little, you find out that there's really no scope there. Nobody really knows what that view should contain completely or even the first iteration of it. And that's because, again, uh, we're approaching this from the wrong direction. We want to approach from business outcomes. Uh, the last technique uh, I'll throw in here as a little test for the people listening, if you want to see if you're doing this correctly today, try to state what your outcomes, your desired outcomes are, but don't use the word data. Just give it a try. See if you can say what you want out of your data management and MDM program uh, and even data governance, but don't say data. You know, you should be coming out with operational and analytical things that, that are real business outcomes. If you can't do it without saying data, you're normal, but that should tell you something. <laughs> it's time It's time to take a pause. Uh, and again, we'll go through a lot of examples uh, tomorrow and throughout the, the sessions, I think. Uh, so I'll leave it there with, with the idea, the ominous statement that if you don't correct this now, you will have this discussion. You'll have it at the next budget cycle when you go to pitch for more money to, to come over the finish line or do the next iteration and a business stakeholder says gee what did you do with all that money and if you start to explain data quality and data architecture to them be mindful that you're competing with someone who has it in their head that if they just buy a crm system their revenue is going to go up 15 percent 
without any other effort. A vendor has convinced them that that's true, and there may be even a little real truth to that, but that's what you're competing with. So if you if you start off with that business proposition that those objective results that are measurable, you're gonna you won't have to go through that nine months later, and it will be far less painful, and you'll be insulated against external events like M and A, and we'll go through that a little more in the subsequent sessions. But I'll leave that there. Excellent. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack in, in all of that. Christopher, let me uh, ask you to, to, to chime in a little bit on your perspective on, uh, um, from a salesperson's perspective. You also speak to a lot of people, but from a different angle. Um, how many of your uh, uh, prospective customers come to you with a, a requirement that doesn't use the word data? <laughs> it's, uh, as Bill said, this is, I think, one of the fundamental challenges in this space is that um, the people that understand the data architecture, the overall data state, the people that understand, geez, I've got customer or product data in more than one place, they are the data architects, right? It's, it's the people in IT that get that um, and they re recognize there's probably issues. Um, but as Bill said, nine times out of 10, they want to go solving those issues from the data perspective. Um, and <laughs> the whole point of the conversation today is that a better data architecture or good data is really not the point. That's that's the means to the end. It's actually not the end. And you've got to keep digging for impacts. You know, when I hear we've got bad data, we've got bad customer data, or we've got bad analytics, you know, alarm bells go off because you need to start figuring out how does that bad data actually impact different business functions. Um, and if you can't get to that in a concrete way, you're going to need to stop and back up. Um, you know, just trying to put in a, a platform to improve data quality is very unlikely to be a successful program. Yeah, let me throw in my own perspective on that. When I first started working in the, the data space, um, it quickly became obvious that pretty much everybody in the world, every company in the world has data problems. It, it's impossible to have data and not have data problems. The question is which data problems are worth fixing, which ones are worth time and money and effort into getting them right uh, because it's going to have a measurable and significant business impact as opposed yeah. to things that you could spend time on that don't matter at all. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem with good data being the goal is twofold. It's one, there's no boundaries. Right? It's like, where do I stop? <laughs> when is my data good enough? So it's, it's an amorphous and undefined thing. But I think even more dangerous is when good data is the goal, you're kind of de facto treating all data equal. And not all data is of equal value to the organization. Um, and so you've got to use this notion of understanding actual um, operational or analytical impact, business impacts as a way to back up, but also to create focus and clarity. Excellent. Yeah, I, we'll get into this in a little bit more uh, depth in a bit. But uh, Harbert, do you want to uh, chime in with uh, um, all, all data is not equal, all data uh, improvements don't necessarily create a return on investment. How, how do you uh, encounter that when you're working with uh, with customers on business impact roadmaps to help them maximize the ROI of whatever they're about to do? Well, you need to prioritize, and that's true that not, not all data is created equal. And going back to what Bill was saying, you got to look at the business outcome. And if data is contributing to a poor business outcome, you got to look at the business outcome first and the the, the size of what it means by uh, not having the business outcome you want. So we look at it from a perspective of impact and the size of that impact to the organization to be able to prioritize where you focus. Excellent. All right. Uh, that's, a, I think, a good intro. Let's uh, move to the next uh, uh, point um, in terms of business sponsorship and selling to the leadership. Uh, I think, uh, Christopher, I'm going to have you lead off here because I know we have uh, an animated graphic for you to walk through that is, is a little bit part of how you um, how you help customers explain to leadership what it is they're about to do and why. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing here, why do we think it's important? That's basically, what are you trying to sell to your leadership? And then the next question is, well, there's different business lines and functions. Which business leaders or stakeholders do you need to sell to? So you need to do two things. You need to identify the sponsor. Um, and then the bigger challenge is you need to get the business sponsor to understand the data issues, the root problems, and why the desired business outcome has not been attainable in the past. 
because people will say, hey, we made all these investments in Power BI or Tableau. We made all these investments in a new CRM. And we're, you're basically saying, hey, you actually still need to address the data to realize maximum benefits. And you're going to have to overcome those objections. So I think the key thing is do not assume that the key people in the organization that you need as your sponsors actually understand the relationship between data and business outcomes. And so we feel like it's partly our job working with you, the, everyone on this, uh, this webinar, to help uh, business stakeholders understand how business or how data is impacting their functions and their line of business. So it's the goal is to try to get some light bulbs to go off where there's this aha moment. And so I'm going to walk through this little slide. Um, it is something that I've been using for many, uh, many iterations and many years. Um, and I use it a lot when I'm struggling to get the business stakeholders to understand, hey, why are there these underlying data issues? Um, how is it impacting my functions and operations? And how is this thing called master data management going to help? So, Mark, I'll let you kind of just walk through bit by bit on, on building it out. But, you know, first and foremost, if you think about data within a system, um, most of us have worked with CRM systems. Um, I've been on the sales side of things for quite a bit of my career. I'm guilty of, of being the sales guy that doesn't pay attention to data quality. And you can start to have data issues just even within a single system. In fact, sometimes it, it's not always um, just accidental or laziness. Sometimes people will go in and create a new account because they want to sell to a subsidiary in their territory when headquarters is somewhere else. So you can end up with duplicate accounts and duplicate contacts all across your CRM. And look, any modern CRM tool tries to prevent kind of obvious duplicates, but people, uh, humans are creative. Right? When they create information about an account or a contact, they're gonna hear and interpret and enter things their way. So even though I might not be able to create an exact duplicate, you can see we've got some variations here between pre-carrier corp or pre-carrier. Deborah Varchi spelled in every permutation of how you could come up with selling, <laughs> spelling Deborah or spelling Varchi. And so immediately I've got an issue in my CRM because if I want to see all activity for Creek Carrier, I might actually have activities that have been logged against all three, right? So I already don't even have a good view of what's going on in my CRM, which could impact understanding which prospects should I be targeting as high priority, which customers should I be addressing from a customer SAT perspective as a concern. So step one is kind of gluing that kind of thing together. Um, but there's a lot of other impacts around the organization. You know, in this simple example, contacts and companies don't live in a single system. You know, if a carrier company actually goes through and buys a, a product from us, we're going to be pushing them over to our ERP system so that we can invoice and bill them. And we'll need to establish credit rating. We need to probably enrich information. And so, you know, the handoff from CRM to ERP is typically when there is that initial transaction. And you can use the MDM solution to facilitate that, to enrich the data and go fetch information from other systems. Maybe I grab the email from the CRM record, maybe I grab the DUNS number from a third party service. Um, but more importantly, most organizations, when a transaction occurs and they take the record data from CRM and push it over to their ERP for billing, it's a one time event. And that means that when there's updated information on DEBRA or updated information on pre carrier capturing the CRM, it's not shared back out to the rest of the organization. So if we kind of follow the chain around the rest of the way, you know, this order has actually been invoiced. Now we need to ship it. We're going to go over to our supply chain team and have them work through order fulfillment. And the dilemma there is they might have an out-of-date address and we've got shipments being sent to the wrong place. Or invoices going to the wrong place. And so once again, we've got data that resides in multiple systems. We need a mechanism to ensure that the data across all these systems, CRM, ERP, supply chain management, is consistent and harmonized. So don't think of MDM as just deduping. It's actually about how can I put a platform that allow me to continuously harmonize data so that we're all seeing from the same playbook when we're engaging with customers or going through operations. And then lastly, when data is inconsistent, when it's not harmonized, Trying to dump everything into a, a modern data warehouse or just a classic data warehouse, it doesn't really matter the tooling, whether you're using Snowflake or on-premise SQL Server. If the data is duplicated and inconsistent across systems, you're going to have trouble getting accurate analytics. Right? I'd have to figure out that I've got to aggregate all of the transactions across these five different variations of pre-carrier in order to get accurate analytics. 
when I've got an MDM platform, I'm doing that continuously. It's like the MDM solution becomes the self-maintaining Rosetta Stone that lets you link up transactions from across the organization, even if there are duplicates, and get accuracy. So I use this as a tool because it does a couple things. Um, I can help business stakeholders recognize, that, hey, the real issue here is misalignment of data, data that evolves and changes in one system and nobody else learns about these recent updates. The other reason is it can help you identify the business sponsor, right? If the issue is, hey, we're not getting invoices to the right place and our day sales outstanding is growing um, because I don't have the right addresses in my ERP system or in my finance system, then I know I'm going to be looking to the CFO as my business sponsor. If the other issue is in my supply chain system, there's three or 4% of the shipment addresses that are not accurate, that are not up to date, and I'm misshipping stuff and having to reship. I know I need to get somebody in the CEO's office as my business sponsor. So, you know, this can be a tool to kind of get the light bulb to go off to start to understand what are the actual business impacts to our misaligned data. And I would say to the, the audience here, one of the things I'd recommend is you think about um, doing this same kind of exercise with some of your leadership and some of your peers in the organization, but don't use a slide, actually sit in the whiteboard and say, hey, let's actually do an assessment. Where does our customer data live? Where does it get created initially? How does it move from system to system? And then the real trick question here is, hey, when somebody updates something in ERP, how do the supply chain team and the sales team find out about it? When somebody adds something to CRM, how does the, the finance team, the operations team find out about it? So think about the ongoing changes to data after you map this out for your organization. Thanks, Christopher. Um, a little bit of context around this slide. We have lots of different variations of DevArchy, uh, a version of our working in healthcare and various different things. Um, this, the context here is uh, this is customer data. We use it as an example because most people most easily resonate to it, not because it's uh, you know, by any means a definition of, of uh, MDM. This is just one example. And also this is a little bit more manufacturing oriented than anything else. So um, we, we just pick one fairly common, easy to relate to example for this, uh, for this conversation here. But it, it expands in lots of different areas. Um, let me ask a, a quick question to, to uh, uh, Bill and Harbert to, to ask them to, to weigh in here. How much education, um, Christopher here was talking about, you know, the need to educate a little bit before you can uh, um, evangelize and explain the value of, of uh, the solution. Uh, how much education do you find is necessary um, as part of the selling to leadership? So I, I look at this as sort of a, a, a small spectrum. I don't want to say broad spe spectrum. On one end uh, are the business stakeholders that you don't really want to educate at all in terms of data management. You just want to get them to state what their problems are operationally and analytically and then attack them going back to the sort of the ESP story I told earlier. You wouldn't tell them you were, you were in integrating their systems with each other with an ESP. Uh, it, MDM and data can fall into the same category with stakeholders like that. Uh, I, I often say that one of the best and most impactful MDM programs I ever worked on was at a brokerage and it was called 21st Century New Account Opening and no one in the business knew or cared that MDM was involved. All they knew was that on Monday morning when we went live, you would get the same experience in a branch office or at home on the web and a lot of other things would work a lot better and people would be more productive. If you said in an elevator, oh, you know, MDM's in there, they would just look at you like you were out of your mind. Uh, so, you know, there, that's one end of the spectrum. But again, one of my first projects was with a, sponsored by a CEO program, sponsored by a CEO that was a former CIO. And this guy knew every nut and bolt uh, that was going on from start to finish and was happy to write the checks because he knew what we were doing. And when we went live, he actually stood up and said, you, you know, the, I'm probably one of the only people that knows exactly what it took to do this. Uh, and, you know, I think it was money well spent. And I'm not even going to say how much money it was because it was very, very high. But there's a spectrum. You know, again, a lot of this can be personality driven. You have to get governance up and going. There are people that don't need to know anything and there are people that are going to want to know quite a bit. So it's really what it takes to get them to to step in and engage with you. The other thing I would say. It's, it's OK to go by. A, I'm sorry, Christopher, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say the, to the, the audience here is the other thing I've found is um, do not assume that even in, within IT function with your peers and other people in, in IT that um, MDM is well understood. It's often thought of as deduping. It's often thought of as some kind of weird esoteric data quality. Do not make the assumption that 
MDM is well understood. People say, do you, do you know what MDM is? And we'll say yes, and you need to pursue that a little further and test it to figure out if they need to be educated. Because again, if they don't understand what the technical capabilities are, they're not going to be able to understand how you're going to help them apply those capabilities to solve an actual problem. Right. And so enough education. This is also, I think, I'm sorry, good. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> There's also education on the IT department side. Oftentimes, IT will think in uh, bits and bytes and tables and data warehouses, and that's all important. Uh, but you also have to educate the IT department on what business speak is and what business outcomes are. So it really is kind of bridging that gap between IT and business to be able to speak the same language to understand what uh, these investments in information technology and data will mean for the business. Uh, so that's part of the education also. Yeah. So there's a spectrum, I think, is the answer to my question is how much education. Um, some people will buy the BMW off the lot without opening the hood uh, and looking under the hood and looking at the engine because they just don't care because uh, they know that it drives nicely. Or some people will really want to look under the hood and understand all of that. It kind of depends uh, on your audience as to how much information they need in order to be comfortable that this all kind of makes sense. Okay, um, let's move to the, the next uh, um, piece of the, the conversation here. So uh, we already talked about why is it important, business sponsorship, and then a key part of business sponsorship um, to our whole point here of it's not about the technology so much as about the, uh, the outcome. Um, Harbert, can we have you talk a little bit about uh, the business case and uh, you know the whole function that you have around business impact uh, roadmap is around that. So can you talk a little bit about that? And I'll, I'll, I know you have a support slide here. I'll pop that up whenever you're ready. Absolutely. Please uh, bring up that su support slide. The uh, number one reason for MDM failure, as, as uh, noted by Gartner, is the failure to, and the lack of a business case to qualify and quantify that business impact, the, the value creation that can happen in business. In our experience at Prophecy, is that there's a huge plurality of uh, projects that fail to go beyond piloting and experimentation just because you don't understand the, the business outcome and the business case. Uh, we've also done research and understand that so many times there's not alignment between what the business needs and what IT is trying to deliver. And the business impact roadmap approach really is to kind of deliver that business case to help scope the project get the sponsorship to buy off on it, and also to, you know, obviously crucial to get the, get the funding. So really the question then becomes, what does good look like? And for what I'm about to go over is kind of what makes up a good business case. Everyone thinks of business case as numbers, a net present value calculation, return on investment, and that's really important, of, of course, because you want to be able to, to, to show what that business impact is. But a good business case is so much more than a set of numbers. Uh, a good business case, in my mind, defines and describes what I call the sense of urgency. What is that burning platform? You know, what is it going to mean for the business? And going back to what Bill and Christopher were talking about earlier, a 360-degree view of the customer is not a business driver. It's certainly not a burning platform. The same goes for a kind of a single source of truth. All these things are super important and relevant to a business. There's things you want to achieve, but what's really important is how you break that out into solving a specific problem or enabling a specific opportunity. So for a business case to be relevant, you really do have to solve an underlying problem. You have to be, or you have to be able to enable some type of new opportunity. And where the quantification comes in is the ability to understand what that impact is for the business. So if you're going to solve a problem, how big is that problem? You're going to enable an opportunity how big is that you know opportunity that you're going to enable and this is where data comes in you know so when you think about 360 degree view of the customer or the single version of truth you really have to peel the onion back and understand at the lowest level of detail what you're trying to accomplish what does it mean for the business that gets back to business outcomes and what business outcomes are all about business outcomes are or, or things that result from a business process. So if you're going to have a business outcome and you have you know, better customer data, what does that mean for your ability to cross-sell and upsell? If you have a business outcome that handles materials, what does that mean for your inventory management? That's a business outcome. 
Uh, we were talking earlier about shipping to the wrong addresses. We'll get plenty of examples tomorrow. Uh, but what does that the business outcome mean? What does that mean for the business? What can you not do or what is causing you pain today? So when we go over to tomorrow, we'll go over details of how to craft a business case and also what it means, that what we call the why. Uh, but here, what makes a good uh, business case is that sense of urgency in that burning platform. It's also by understanding that sense of urgency in that burning platform is also what gives you the ability to identify that sponsorship and also to recruit that sponsorship for your organizational readiness. That is, that is key to the, uh, the business case and to succeeding with the master data management. Yeah, if I, if I could chime in there, and it's, it's probably echoing a little bit of what you said, Harvard, but you know, over the years, uh, I have seen this over and over. You know, as we engage with uh, clients from my current experience, my prior experience, you know, we always ask about you know, what is your business case and, and what's your program scope and how are you going about defining that? And it feels like sometimes um, the people we're talking to aren't hearing the question and they'll come back and say, oh, no, we got a budget and we built an ROI study and, and we got a good ROI. And I think the single biggest mistake I see is organizations focus solely on, hey, is there an ROI? And that's not, as, as Harvard was just saying, that's not, that's in part of a business case. But to me, a solid business case is actually all about informing the setting of priorities. How do I know, should I start with material or should I start with custom? If I haven't quantified the, the business problems, which one's more important, right? How do I figure out which data has more value or more of, which is the data problem with the lowest hanging fruit? Um, so I need to be able to inform the setting of priorities. The other key thing is quantifying success. How can I go back to leadership and say, hey, we improved the order fulfillment error rate and missed shipments, you know, we took it from 3% to 1%. You can put dollars on it. Saying, hey, the, the address data is more clean, it's pretty hard to, to actually say, hey, is that a success or not? You know, it's great, the address data is more clean, but who cares, right? So what? Well, if we're shipping orders correctly, um, a higher percentage of the time, there's, there's an actually a, something you can measure to say, were we successful or not? But maybe the most interesting thing and I heard this from one of my customers years ago um, that was a, a key sponsor. He often goes speak uh, on behalf of, of the solution. Um, and he said the real big reason for having a solid business case is it provides project guardrails. And what he meant by that is when people see a, a, a really robust MDM solution being stood up in the organization, there will be other stakeholders and other people in IT who say, oh, I want a piece of that. Hey, can you put my data in there? Hey, I want these three attributes about the customer for my use case. And it's really easy for programs uh, creep to spiral out of control when you've got a great MDM solution that's being stood up. Where everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and get some of their data in there on that first phase. And uh, this client would actually go straight to the business case and say, hey, does your data actually affect these specific outcomes that we're focusing on and if the answer is no, it's like, great, we'll get to you in phase two, right? Or we'll do a business study to figure out if you should be phase two or phase three. So you can use a good business case as a way to keep the scope controlled and put some guardrails around your project. Um, we, we got a couple of questions around uh, uh, the, the business impact roadmap um, coming up, Harbert. So let me uh, um, throw them at you right now. Um, how much cost and time does it take to do one of these exercises? Uh, and let me ask the second question at the same time, how much stakeholder involvement, what, what stakeholders and how much involvement uh, should people around the organization have in order to come up with a good, um, what we call a BIR? Okay, uh, we don't charge for a business impact roadmap. It's part of our service offering because we want our MDM um, projects to, to succeed. And based upon how, how long it takes, it really depends upon the depth and the analysis that uh, we want to go through and that you know it goes from client to client sometimes it can take uh, five days sometimes it can take uh, 10 days not a full five days or full 10 days normally we try to target anywhere from five to ten interviews and we like to include both the business and IT uh, we also think it's important to bring in upper level uh, leaders into the conversation because with that you're beginning to identify your your stakeholders and your sponsorship and you're beginning to try to get their input and feedback into what's happening with the business. Uh, 
to, to kind of play off what Christopher was saying, we really do want to look at business outcomes and we want to be able to provide those guardrails and kind of the scope to help you with your project. And the business impact roadmap, as you would expect with roadmap, is to define that kind of roadmaps and steps and where you go with the MDM solution. Excellent. If I'll jump in for a second, Martin, it's, it's been interesting in my experience when when this is done right, some organizations actually realize, that, hey, we, we were looking at MDM because we thought we needed to solve a customer data problem, but after a, a business impact roadmap, they figure out that the real data issue is somewhere else. Or maybe it's customer data, but it's not cross-sell, upsell. Maybe it is finance fulfillment, or maybe it is order fulfillment or some other function. And so, you know, it, had they gone forward, selected a solution, be it prophecy or any other solution, they would have been solving the wrong problem right? because they didn't go out and quantify. So it gets back to good data for the sake of good data is a very dangerous thing. And, and you need to back up and figure out what data do we care about and why and how can I measure it. The other thing this the other thing this does for you, uh, aside from the the guardrails for for what you're doing currently, is I, I may have said something about this earlier, is it provides impact analysis if the things around you change. If there's an acquisition, if a stakeholder decides to move on and is replaced with someone uh, that may not be as familiar with what's going on, you you now have an objective yardstick to show them. Here's why your predecessor, here's what they agreed to, and here's why they agreed to it. If you don't believe, you know, it's not a matter of whether you believe in data management, do you believe in this outcome? And generally that's gonna be something they're gonna be more familiar with or can at least analyze. So again, this sort of buffer to external, any external event, rather than uh, everybody here has probably heard heard this the story of someone who believed in data management left and was replaced with somebody who was more operational and all of a sudden everything got put on hold uh, in favor of things that probably weren't as valuable. So again, it's it's not just that sort of, am I doing the right thing if when I looked to, to the, my left and to my right, but as I look ahead, is it still the right thing? Yeah, another question that just came up here is, uh, um, when you're looking at the, the BIRs and, and all of the analysis, how many of them did not proceed, uh, projects did not proceed uh, having done that analysis, or do you always end up finding a way to proceed? Uh, Harvard, I'll ask you to, to pick that one up first. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, most, we've had clients that you know, will back out of a, a BIR for one reason or another, uh, COVID has been a uh, you know interesting case study you know where people have had a uh, you know very good BIRs and they put things on hold just because budgets are being put on hold. Um, we find that probably 90% of the time, if not you know higher, that once someone commits to going through the BIR, they almost always commit to uh, going forward with the MDM project. Um, and the reason why is if you do a good problem definition. And uh, you really, you know, kind of define what those new opportunities are. Management usually buys off on it. Uh, there's, you know, there's always those instances where people will back out. But it really, once you get that commitment for, from uh, leadership to participate in the BIR process, you know, our, our probability of going forward with the MD, MDM is, is uh, super high. You know, we've had instances where we've done a BIR and people have chosen to go on with a, another solution. We know that's a risk of us offering the service. Uh, but we think MDM, um, you know, and how, you know, the, pro the prophecy platform, we think how we do the BIR is a differentiator in the market. And we've had fabulous results of people going forward with MDM solutions. I would say we're also able to do it because at the end of the day, uh, our, our TCO is much better than most of our competitors. So that you're not backing up whatever this BIR value statement is against a multi-million dollar price tag. So it becomes easier to, to move forward at that point. And then the last thing I'll chime in on is it also is, is frankly, if we can't identify a real business impact, I don't want customers to move forward. Right? And we want to grow um, as an organization for sure. But I do, there's no, it will be no help to, to my customer success team to be cramming square pegs into round holes or for organizations to engage on a data management project when they've not yet identified the, the impact, right? The actual quantifiable value of doing so. Um, and so I encourage organizations all the time, hey, if you can't get to an impact, if this BIR exercise didn't reveal an impact, you probably need to take a step back before you keep investing in data management tooling and dig deeper into 
where are your data issues um, that are that are actually having some kind of impact? And maybe it's a recasting the BIR to different business lines or to different data subject areas, um, whether you do that with us or on your own. But you really back to the the, the whole topic of the, the session today. You know, are you ready for MDM? If you can't find a real impact, the answer is no. And you need to, to pump the brakes and, and take a step back and start digging in to find the actual business issues you're going to resolve. And I, I would piggyback and on what, what Harbert said a little bit ago. When we do find them, which is most of the time, they're not, I don't want to say they're not intelligent, but they're not rocket science. They're usually obvious and compelling, I would say. You know, 95% of the time, they don't even require explanation beyond that. Um, and I'm, if there's not a benefit or an ROI, we will say that. We, we're not, you know, this is an analytical approach. We're trying to look at data. We're trying to look at business problems. We're trying to look at opportunities. And if the BIR comes back and there's not a return, or there's not a huge opportunity, then we say that. That's part of the process. We want the, we want the approach and the numbers to speak for themselves. Yeah, the, uh, the, what Bill just said, it's uh, one of the reasons to engage with, with somebody like Harbert and our team to do a BIR is, from the years of experience, one of the things that Harvard brings, it's not that Prophecy's got a better ROI spreadsheet, it's that Harvard knows all the rocks to look under, right? all the different ways bad data has hurt other companies, and it's it's that wisdom that allows this process to be impactful. That, that actually um, is a good segue to a question that uh, popped up online that, that I've been trying to answer, ask for the last, like, three interruptions here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, um, is uh, how do you model within a BIR? How do you model not just return on investment, um, you know, from upside, but also from protecting downside, meaning regulatory or compliance requirements? How, how do they uh, show up, and how should they show up when you're modeling this? Well, we do that a, a couple ways. Um, for example, with the California Compliance Privacy Act, um, the CCPA. Um, you know, you, you can get a request of, of, of how your information is being handled, and there's usually a cost from organizations. So sometimes with compliance, there's operational costs that we can model. Um, in other instances, you know, if, you, if, if there's not a specific operational cost of, a, of, a, of a, with the compliance, we'll look at um, risk factors and fines and potential for, uh, for fines. And with some of the the healthcare things with the, the CARES 21st Act, there are some real fines when data is not interoperable. And those are real fines and they go into this, the seven figures. So uh, normally we, we, we try to, to focus on the operational efficiencies, efficiencies from the, the compliance and maintaining compliance, um, but there's always that potential for fines and penalties that we want to highlight. Okay, great. Um, let me just, uh, uh, ask if there's any other questions. I've, I've handled a few of the questions as we've been going through here, but if there's any other questions, uh, now would be a good time to type them in. Um, there's two more uh, that, that just came up. Um, how does COVID, uh, how does the, the, I guess, the lockdown and pandemic uh, impact any of this? Does it, has it accelerated uh, requirements or, or not? Does it change anything of the dynamic? The, uh, I'm going to take this, and I hope uh, Christopher and Bill will, will uh, pipe in. I'm finding that we're having really good detailed interviews. And by doing it online and virtual, it forces you to have your, your questions more uh, defined and laid out, and people will go and gather data. And we're able to do some incredible analysis uh, remotely through, uh, through the beer process. We used to do this, you know, on site. And we still can once you know the you know, COVID hold is uh, no longer. But we're finding that we're getting even better uh, outputs or as good of outputs we were previously. So um, you know we're, we go on Zoom calls, we lay out we lay out our interviews, we collect data, we document it, we put out notes, and the the results have been very surprising to me. Uh, I would say I've been the busiest I've ever been since being a prophecy and. Uh, I think I actually wrote a blog, I think six or seven weeks ago, uh, when we were in the middle of this thing, uh, here in New York city. And, uh, I looked out over all the activity that was going on with prophecy. And really what it seemed to me was that, uh, firms, uh, large and small are, were kind of more willing to do some soul searching, you know, the things they knew they were supposed to be doing or should have done, 
uh, less operational stuff going on. And to their credit, to these firms' credit, they're saying, okay, you know, I've got a couple of cycles here. Uh, we've been looking at uh, things like MDM or data management or, the, or the, the, the bad outcomes or lack of outcomes we have today. And let's sit down and think about them and bring some people in to help us. Uh, and, you know, I think the aggregate of that is accounted for the increase in the activity I have. I don't know what, Christopher, what you're seeing there. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Many organizations are taking this as a, an opportunity to reflect. Um, and a, a lot of organizations, you know, even if they're um, capital constrained, right, they're thinking about cash flow right now, they're still proceeding with investigation. They're still proceeding with incremental investment because I think everybody is expecting, you know, that <laughs> once we get past this, it's going to be a race out of the gates, right? And everybody wants to be ready to go to come out with some kind of, of operational improvement, some kind of competitive advantage um, as this market starts to come back up. And we're lucky uh, that I'll call it lucky that uh, the product we have and our organization structure that they can actually think about providing some value before this at, this is over yeah. and be ready. So, so a few more questions that I, I want to get to. Um, the, the kind of the, the classic question I think <clears throat> that just came up is uh, um, where should MDM be positioned? I, I think that means owned organizationally, uh, IT or uh, like business. Uh, I, Okay, yeah, that's a perennial question. I'm, I'm guessing Bill may have an, uh, a thought on that. So the simple answer is, uh, or the one that's going to apply to the most people at one stroke is, you know, MDM, the technology belongs in IT. Uh, and again, I'll use that sort of ESB analogy, but the practice of MDM and the governance that goes with it has to be owned by the business. And I speak as someone who, tr who, who was ordered to own it in, within IT uh, completely a couple of times, and I won't say it failed, but it was a struggle and would not have been uh, if the business had taken it over. Yeah, that's, I think that gets back to the this notion of, you know, we're talking about a business impact roadmap. When we talk about roadmap, that's because we're thinking about data management as a program, and you might start with how do I handle materials and do better inventory management and then go to supplier and supplier onboarding and can I streamline that process and ensure consistent terms and then on to the next and on to the next and on to the next. The platform, you know, a, a robust MDM platform like Prophecy supports all of those use cases, right? The one platform. So therefore, it, it has to be Switzerland, right? It has to live in IT. But going down this program with each of these kind of milestones in your journey, you're going to need to engage during those that phase or during that deployment with the appropriate business sponsors. We're talking about back to the, the correct sponsorship. And you need sponsorship because there will always be a degree of data stewardship that's going to come along with this. And they need to be bought into, hey, applying a technology and a tool is actually going to save my team time um, because a lot of data stewardship is happening in a reactionary way that's costly um, and both time and, and people. Um, but also that there is a measure that, that, hey, we're doing this for a reason and we're going to measure and track that reason. So the actual sponsors are going to kind of grow and, and change over your, your data management journey. Right? And it's based upon where are you focused right now on that journey. Okay. And so for the person that asked that question, uh, you had a two-part question. I think we covered the second part as well. Um, which is kind of how to engage uh, um, IT in the conversation. But if we didn't, uh, feel free to, to ask that again. Another related question that just came up is, what's the role of data management here? Um, I, I guess, relative to uh, organizational ownership that you were just addressing there. I'll, I'll jump on that first, and I'm sure everybody else has, has thoughts on that as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, think of uh, a technology like master data management, a technology like prophecy. This is an enabler. Right? This is a, a tool that can bring automation, that can bring process, that can bring intelligence to the act of data management. Um, but actual data, when you look at it, where does a customer get created? Well, it gets created by somebody in sales in a CRM tool. Where does the billing information get put in? It gets put in by somebody in finance in the ERP platform. Data is always managed and created and curated in your various operational systems across your data state by business stakeholders. That's why they've got to be involved, right? So the, the technology, the tooling, IT will be responsible for owning that. They will probably be responsible for the configuration and support of that platform to enable processes that are specific to your organization. 
But again, the actual people that are managing data, you know, even bringing in automation of a, a robust MDM platform like Prophecy, the day-to-day -day management data is still going to fall into line of business stakeholders. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's a think a follow-on to that question asking about the role of the data steward and is that not uh, uh, the link pin um, to, to how all this comes together? Any thoughts? <laughs> well, the bad news is there's no one, like this is a, I couldn't create a job description for a data steward that's a boilerplate that would apply to everybody on this web. There's just no way. So again, many organizations, data stewardship's happening. It's just, it's not being done proactively. It's not being done with process. It's when something breaks, a bunch of people get an all hands on deck kind of call and they end up working the weekend to go fix and correct data so that the invoices go out or the product can ship um, or so we can get a report from the, to the marketing team so they can segment the customers. So a lot of data stewardship is happening in the, the worst way possible, you know, un ungoverned, unmanaged, under the covers, done in Excel. Um, ideally, when you bring in a data management program and enable it with good technology, you're going to streamline and bring more thought and control to those ad hoc processes. And with automation, you're going to reduce the amount of that effort. So one of the things I hear all the time when I engage with organizations is, wow, all my people have day jobs. Nobody has time to be a data steward. <laughs> That's when you got to get back to, hey, what's the actual business issue? And when things go wrong, how many people have to jump on that all hands on deck call to go fix it and how often does that happen? It's, that's the reactionary data stewardship that's already happening. If we get rid of that, you're gonna have plenty of time to do proactive automated data management. So that, that's what we used to call citizen data stewardship. And just to tie that, that's an excellent uh, tie back to the top of the call of, uh, you can start with asking yourself, what's wrong with that? I mean, it sounds like an obvious question, but you know, there's a, there's a theoretical scenario where that's actually the optimal way for you to do things in your organization from a cost perspective and time perspective. It's probably not. So let's talk about why it isn't, and then move along from there to 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 inhibit it. Okay. Final question, because we're almost out of time here. Um, uh, how how do you think it's important to uh, implement MDM culture in a company? Is, is that a prerequisite for uh, for moving ahead in some shape or form, or is it something that you um, kind of build up and drive as you go? I would call I would say under the under the name of data governance, it's essential. You know, you have to set up some kind of business vehicle, uh, organized business vehicle and process uh, to support this. Back to the 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 question that was asked earlier. Uh, but that's what that is. That's where the business steps in and changes the culture. There should be a meeting every month or so. Uh, where people get together, even if even if it's their their second job, uh, to start to organize and see what what this body of work really looks like in order to be successful. Yeah, I think that's the, that's that's the key. Thing. That's back to the sponsorship. If you've got a clear business case, if there is an impact that is of value, the business sponsor will help drive the cultural shift. Most organizations are recognizing that data is fuel for their digital transformation or competitive advantage. It's got to be demonstrable to a stakeholder for them to, to jump in and say, okay, we are going to change the way we do things, you know, with tooling, with technology, with process to, to really treat that as an asset because we've got a specific outcome we're aiming for. And with KPIs, business KPIs, where users actually have goals that reflect this. Yeah. All right, guys. That's um, what the beer does. It brings in the KPIs. Perfect. Um, we're right at the top of the hour, and uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But there's some questions we didn't get to answer, but let me just summarize real quick. Um, there was a, a, a nice compliment on the professionalism of the presenters. I can't imagine who they're talking about, but uh, that's nice that they said it. Um, a, a request for example, more examples of the kinds of things that uh, um, would be in a, um, a justification, and also ex a request for uh, examples of uh, a BIR in terms of scope and depth and that kind of thing, which I think we should be able to handle on tomorrow's call. And then a question about uh, governance. How does governance relate to data management and MDM, which uh, um, I think that's way too big of a, a can of worms to open today, but I think we should be able to get to that tomorrow. So um, with that, uh, let me uh, uh, thank everybody, the, the, the panel here and all the, the participants and uh, the, the lively questions that came in towards the end there. Uh, we will try and ca capture more of those answers tomorrow and in the rest of the series. 
um, and we hope that uh, um, at least a few of you will come back again tomorrow and, uh, uh, and get into the next step of the conversation, which is around uh, defining the why, um, really kind of you know the, the, the justification, the detailed levels of justification that you would want to go through uh, in order to, to get moving on your MDM journey. Hope you found it valuable and we hope you to see you again tomorrow. Thank you.